discussion of an important new book. I'm sure you've all seen the cover. Ibn al Akhtar, For the War Yet to Come, Planning Beirut's Frontiers. Uh, a very important book. I've had the pleasure of reading it myself. It just came out, I think, just last month, is it? Uh, it's very fresh. You're right here at the moment when uh, this is all brand new. Um, it's a very important book about an essential city. A city that's not just for, uh, essential not just for Lebanon and the Middle East, but for the global south. Uh, it's um, a book of analyses which are really compelling and they're often triggered by the word logic. There are many logics in this book in various degrees of the explicit and the implicit. I am, I should introduce myself, Brinkley Messick, um, I was going to say as an anthropologist. I am a professor of anthropology and I'm also director and also of MISAS and director of the Middle East Institute. Uh, and for me as an anthropologist, uh, I want to note the very original sensibility of the ethnographer, ar uh, uh, architect, <coughs> urban planner, uh, who has methods that are adapted to the perspectives and the problems of the architect and urban planner. This is an ethnography that is uh, innovative in its own regard as an ethnography. As a student of the Sharia, of Islamic law, I note the references in this book to some very detailed analyses of certain kinds of forms that are part of the historical Sharia but are now used in urban real estate, which is really quite amazing. Uh, in the title, The War Yet to Come, we hear about challenges posed by the future <clears throat> and the patterns of antici anticipation in the present. Um, this event is actually a collaboration between the, the Institute I direct, the Middle East Institute, and GSAP, the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. Um, and I want to thank also the three staff members, Simone, Lila, and Stefan, who've been instrumental in organizing this, this whole event. Um, we're going to have a 20-minute, approximately, discussion or presentation by Hiba Abu Akar. And then 10 minute uh, presentations by three uh, visiting speakers, uh, Farag Mir Mirafter, Timothy Mitchell, who's from here, and M. Christine Boyer. And I just would like to introduce them, each one of them, a, a bit right at this point. And so we, we can then flow on to them. They, they will speak for about 10 minutes apiece. First, just to, uh, 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 to identify uh, the author, Hiba, uh, who's assistant professor in a urban planning program at the Columbia GSAP. She has her PhD in city and regional planning uh, from the uh, Global Met Metropolitan Studies in the University of California, Berkeley. Um, she has an earlier co-edited book called Narrating Beirut from its Borderlines. Uh, there's a lot more to be said about her, and she will tell us about her, and you will see her in action. Um, and, but the first of the respondents, the 10-minute respondents, will be Farang Miraftab who is Professor of Urban Planning and Regional Planning at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, she is the author of Women's Empowerment, Participation in Shelter Strategies at the Community Level and Urban Informal Settlements, and a co-editor of Cities and Inequalities in a Global and Neoliberal World, and other works. Timothy Mitchell is from Columbia University, known to many of you perhaps, the Ransford Professor of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies, he um, came to Columbia about uh, in 2008 after a long career, actually 25 years at, at New York University. Yeah. We lured him uptown after we first lured his wife. Um, anyway, he's the, uh, uh, the author of many important books, starting with Colonizing Egypt and more recently, Carbon Democracy, Political Power in the Age of Oil. Uh, M. Christine Boyer is the Kenan Professor of Architecture and Urbanism at Princeton University School of Architecture. She's an urban historian uh, and, and uh, is also has a degree from, and has taught and has had degrees from other universities. But uh, the publication for which uh, the prize was won is Le Corbusier, Le Corbusier Homme de Lettres. Uh, this is a Princeton Architectural uh, Press uh, uh, publication. And also a number of other works, including Dreaming the Rational City, The Myth of, the, of American City Planning, uh, 19, 1890 to 1945, Manhattan Manners, Architecture and Style, 1850 to 1900, and other works. Finally, we'll have an open discussion after the three presentations, uh, with, led by the Dean of, of the School of Architecture, who doesn't need to be identified in this building, which is her project as a whole. <laughs> but she has a, a remarkable new book, 
which I can't pronounce the title of, Work Ek. How do we say this? Work AC. Work AC. <laughs> okay. Work AC, the, the, after the colon, it says, you'll get there when we cross the bridge. This is a, a 2017 book. She's also uh, an editor of the Arab City Architecture of Representation from Columbia 2016. Anyway, thank you all for coming, and we'll turn the, the podium over to the author, Piba Abukar. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I want to start by thanking Dean Amal Andraos, the Dean of the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, GISA, and Professor Bing Masik, the Director for the Middle East Institute, for hosting this book launch. Many thanks to Lila Katier and Simone Rothkowitz for organizing the details of the event. I want to take this opportunity to thank Dean Andraos for her amazing support since I started GSAP. I also want to thank GSAP faculty and staff and my colleagues in the urban planning program for welcoming, my, for welcoming me amongst them. It has been wonderful working with you all. I also want to thank Bernadette Bardzer and Stephanie Chan for their help in the last phase of the project. This book has been a long, long journey. There are so many people who provided me with love and support over the years. Some were there since day one, others I was lucky to meet along the way. I'm especially beyond grateful to two of my dearest friends who traveled here to be here with me today, Nada Mumtaz and Sylvia Nan, and to Rinwa Haid who couldn't make it. I can't thank you enough for all the love and support you've provided over the years, and to Orly Vayalet and Jesus Velasco for providing me with a home in New York City. I'm also thankful to many, many people in Beirut and around the globe who made this book possible. I also want to thank Professor uh, Farnak Miraftal, Professor Timothy Mitchell, and Professor Christine Boyer for, accepting, for generously accepting this invitation. Thank you so much. One day, while I was listening to a popular Lebanese radio show discussing the challenges currently facing Beirut, the show's host at some point said, and I quote, I think we should all start thinking about urban planning. Look around you. In this city, planning lacks planning and order. This was not the first time that I heard such a statement. During my fieldwork, I would often get the same reaction. You went all the way to the United States and came back to here to study planning? Does even planning exist in Beirut? Um, for my interlocutors who had experienced a 15 year of civil war between 1975 and 1990, planning promised a better future, a future of well-being. However, many years later, in a region rocked with violence and millions of refugees, where war always rooms in the horizon, planning has yet to deliver on that promise. <coughs> As someone who lived through the Lebanese Civil War, these feelings were also personal. In the 1980s, my family and I experienced firsthand the geographies of war, including multiple forced displacements. Today, the fear of future wars continues to show, shape our everyday life. But so do promises of a better future of post-war that is yet to come. Through this book, I chose to write about violence in a place I call home itself the landscape of many, many lost homes, making this a quest that has been shaped by my personal history as much as it is a scholarly inquiry into geographies of conflict and its aftermath. To this end, I examine in this book the underlying logics that make the phrase planning lacks planning and order a common sentiment in Beirut. I show that, ch I, I show that such a feeling develops when the specters of wars are always present, when state structures are not clear, and public projects are often outsourced and privatized. However, I argue that such conditions are neither exceptional nor restricted to the paradigm of cities in conflict, like Beirut, Belfast, or Medellin. Assuming these cities are exceptional reproduces the same assumptions that this work seeks to destabilize. These assumptions are mostly rooted on how we think of the temporalities of planning and development intervention. Indeed, for so long, the intertwined fields of planning and development have been configured within an imagined future of progress. However, today, we are at a global moment in which the imagined future in most places in the world, in both the global north and the global south, is one of conflict and contestation, characterized by ecological crises, anticipated terror attacks, and unprecedented influx of refugees and migrants migrants, a horizon of what I call the war yet to come. Taking as my case study post-war Lebanon, I argue that Beirut's peripheries tell us a much different story about planning and its temporalities. And this is a very different story from the one usually told about Beirut 
seen through the prism of its downtown post-war reconstruction project following the end of the war in 1990, characterized by neat colorful master plans, glittering buildings, and emptied out streets. In contrast, Beirut's fast urbanizing peripheries suddenly emerged in 2008 as frontiers of renewed sectarian conflict, where dozens were killed in an episode of violence that was a reminder of the civil war. I argue that this transformation of peripheries into frontiers could be understood through the spatial and temporal logic of the war yet to come. The war yet to come does not treat peace and war and peace as distinct categories. It doesn't approach war as a temporal aberration in a linear time of progress with a beginning and an end. Rather, it focuses on how war, violence, and their anticipation have shaped Beirut's segregated geographies. The logic of the war yet to come has a temporal and a spatial dimension. Temporally, the war yet to come reconfigures the temporalities of the yetsu through which to understand geographic production. It provides a different lens than the yetsu of modernization, which assumes a predictable future that is premised on a belief in the ability to forecast the future and manage territories towards progress, which to this day still guide most of planning and development interventions. The future of the war yet to come instead is uncertain and volatile, and this affects how geographies and their futures are being shaped, contested, and negotiated. Spatially, in times of peace, this war is not a war of tanks, cannons, and rifles, but is fundamentally a geopolitical territorial conflict where the fear of domination of one group by another is fought over land and apartment sales through zoning, planning, and infrastructure projects. The outcomes are planned spaces that are low income, have the overlapping industrial and residential zones where highways are never finished and playgrounds are never built. These are what I call the geographies of the war yet to come. In Lebanon, it is the former civil war militias who are key to shaping these geographies. Since the end of the war, these militias have become major religious political organizations and actually are the primary actors, uh, primary spatial and development actors who challenge our understanding of geographic production because they operate in, uh, simultaneously inside the state and outside it. In the book, the four actors I focus on are the Shia Hezbollah, the Sunni Future Movement, the Druze Progressive Socialist Party, or the PSP, and for those few are, uh, who are unfamiliar with the Druze, they're a minority religious group, and the Maronite Christian Church, which is not itself a militia, but, is, uh, but there are militias associated with it. These four groups were the most present on the ground in the southern peripheral areas where I conducted most of the fieldwork for this book. To understand how planning is actually practiced on the ground, I conducted an ethnography of spatial practices, which I would be happy to talk more about during Q&A, in three southern peripheries of Beirut, namely Hai Madi Marm Khayel, Sahra Shwaife, and Dawhit Aramun. As you can see on the map, these areas are peripheries of not only municipal Beirut, but also of the southern suburbs of Beirut, commonly known as the Dahi, considered to be the stronghold of the Shia Hezbollah in the city, which has long been at stake in this contestation. From my research in these sites, three spatial and temporal lenses of growth emerged, mostly doubleness, namely doubleness, lacework, and ballooning. Conceptually, these three processes reveal how planning and space making in post-conflict cities mold space and time in labyrinthine ways, in contrast to the teleological assumptions about growth, characterized by, for example, the concentric model of urban growth that assigns degrees of urbanization, starting with a dense center and moving outwards to a less dense periphery. Hamad Imam Khayel, the neighborhood, close, the neighborhood closest to Beirut and al was a predominantly Christian neighborhood before the, before the Civil War. Its post-conflict geography can be understood through what I call the doubleness of ruins. In 2004, when I first visited, the streets were buzzing with life. Children were playing, elderly were congregating amidst sounds coming from the busy light industries in the area. The neighborhood's war scarred buildings, bombed and abandoned during the Civil War, had been transformed into makeshift homes for families that were displaced in 1975 from South Lebanon. So as you can see in the slide, people actually made homes inside these bombed out buildings. 
Many families who I spoke to had been living in the area for, th for 30 years and they were awaiting post-war governmental compensation in order to leave. When I returned in 2009, the area felt like a ghost town. War displaced families had been evicted, ruins stood empty, new fancy yet empty buildings dotted the landscape, with the apartments selling upward of $350,000. It was a checkered geography of ruins and construction. When I asked about why some buildings were still in ruins, while many others have been demolished and replaced, I learned that the church had actually stopped the sale and development of these ruins. My investigation into this checkered geography of ruins and construction shows how the area has become one of the major contested frontiers in times of peace, where the Christians and Shias are struggling over land. And it did through the Maronite church on the Christian side and Hezbollah-affiliated real estate developers on the Shia side. If the ruins stayed intact, the land was bought by the church. If it was replaced, the land is being developed by Shia developer. On the local level, this territorial war is conducted through channeling real estate markets, changing land policies, and modifying building and zoning laws. Internationally, it unfolds through global networks of finance, fundraising, and, fundraising and religious allegiances. For example, church affiliates are trying to change the preemption law in land sales to expand the right of first refusal to the Christian community writ large. Shia developers are traveling to DC, Sydney, and Sao Paulo to buy land in high Modi from landowners who immigrated during the war and never returned. The church is trying to overturn these real, real estate transactions. Public officials are changing the zoning and building laws to make investment for Shia developers unprofitable. And local municipalities are prohibiting land sales between Christians and Muslims. In this contested geography, civil war ruins are the ruins of a contested past as much as they are ruins in contested presents and futures. Leftover ruins are indicators of an ongoing territorial war that's actually not very different from the civil war. This critical excavation exercise of ruins shows the contradictions and crises that lie in the constructed binaries between war and peace, future and past, progress and violence, construction and destruction, even home and displacement, segregation and coexistence. Many of the war displaced families in Hay Madi Maram Khai eventually moved to Sahra Shwaifid after receiving monetary compensation. Sahra Shwaifid is located next to the Beirut International Airport and is the second tiered periphery of Beirut and Al-Dahi. During the civil war, the area was an agricultural land heavily guarded by its Jews landowners. The two main warring factions here today are the Shia Hezbollah and the Druze affiliated PSP. After the end of the war, with pressure of urbanization from Dahi, massive low-cost housing projects started mushrooming in the area, which eventually housed many of the war Shia war displaced families. They were mostly Hezbollah supporters. The real estate developers were also Hezbollah affiliates who were financially supported to provide low-cost housing in the area. These massive developments started alarming the municipality, which was affiliated with the PSP. <coughs> In order to stop the urbanization of the area as a Shia territory, the PSP, through its different positions inside and outside the government, worked towards zoning the area as industrial. At the same time, Hezbollah worked to zone it as residential. As political alliances between these two groups ebbed and flowed, <coughs> zoning and building laws kept changing. For example, between 1996 and 2008, the master plan and zoning of Sahra Shwaifid changed eight times in 12 years which you can see in the slide here, red is industrial, red, uh, green is residential, how it changed between 1996 and 2008. In Sahra Shwaifid, and I quote, industrial zone is a synonym for Druze territory, and residential zone is a synonym for a Shia territory, as one planner told me. <coughs> between the industrial and residential, Sahra Shwaifid is now a patchwork of apartment buildings in the vicinity of industries and an active urban agriculture area. Every winter, the area witnesses an environmental disaster when rainwater gets mixed with industrial waste and soil fills the residential streets, causing new phases of displacement. In 2008, as sectarian battles raged in the streets of Sahra Shwaifid, another battle took place 
over another rezoning iteration. The PSP passed a master plan that re-inscribes the area as middle income to slow its urbanization. For example, you could see how the 2004 law allowed hollow concrete and thin sheets, i.e. red low income. However, the 2008 law imposed expensive stone cladding and red tile roofing and decreased the number of allowed apartments per floor, making the area less affordable. This rezoning is not only related to these actors positioning in local wars, but also regional ones. Sahra Shwaifet was bombed in the July 2006 Israeli war on Lebanon and was targeted by an ISIS-affiliated suicide bomber in 2014, inserting Beirut's peripheries as a node in the Arab-Israeli and Sunni-Shia regional conflicts in the Middle East. Therefore, military geographies are also key to these rezoning schemes, since both actors function as paramilitaries with expected roles in local and regional wars yet to come. Therefore, paramilitary urban strategies like domination of hilltops and access to weapons are key to these planned geographies. For example, the contestation over industrial residential zoning had also to do with the ability to connect to the airport. Also, PSP's rezoning of hilltops as villa zones aimed to stop urbanization on militarily strategic hills. So you see here how the zoning changed from D, which is a regular residential, to V, which is a villa area. These planning practices have now created a lacework of urbanization that folds areas for housing into an industrial and agricultural zones, mixed areas controlled by Shias and one with controlled by Druze, and delineates new contours of sectarian violence and engagement. Not very far from Sahra Shwaifit is Dawhit Aramu, the furthest of the three sites from Beirut and al -Dahid. Its urban development is characterized by a mixture of lavishness and extreme poverty, of spectacular views of the Mediterranean Sea, and of garbage filling its river streams. <coughs> this was a result of how the area ballooned over time, without much regulation, to a dense periphery primarily for Sunni families undergoing gentrification from the post-war reconstruction of downtown Beirut. The Sunni Future Movement, which controlled the government after the Civil War, actually supported this transformation by investing in large-scale capital projects, pl capital planning projects, funded by international aid and loans, to upgrade the area through highways and infrastructure. They also planned to channel development monies to the area through the Lebanese National Physical Master Plan approved in 2009. Meanwhile, excluding the nearby poor and mostly Shia Zahra Shwaifit. So you can see here, this is the area, the Dahit Aramun, uh, delineated by the red line, and this is Zahra Shwaifit. This is uh, where the, the development target area uh, was delineated. Later, as people started moving from the overpopulated Dahi towards Dahit Aramun, Shia developers used market tactics to build apartment buildings that were mostly sold to Shia families. Actually, while well, initially people coexisted peacefully, in 2008, as the future movement and Hezbollah fought battles, the area emerged as a battleground where people were killed and others were displaced. The chapter traces the talk of war and rumors of militarization that have accompanied the construction frenzy of Dawhit Aramun and illustrates how minority religious groups like the Druze have actually become brokers in a, in a war fought not only locally but regionally. Together, these case studies show that the failure of planning Beirut's new peripheral development to provide residents with safe environments is actually not about the failure of plan, planning or the ways such spaces may defy the logic of planning. In fact, these peripheries are intricately planned. The ordering of the present, as we saw it instead, is produced by several contested planning exercises over different imagined futures rendering planning as a tool of conflict as much as that of peace and order. In such context, planning practices involve innovative techniques to continuously balance a speciality of political difference in order to keep a war at bay when possible, while simultaneously allowing for urban growth and development profit. As planning is evacuated of its development ideals, Globally and locally, planners have increasingly become the technicians of the spatial logic of the warrior to come. However, 
Despite how outlandish these practices may sound, hardly make Beirut an anomaly. Urban futures of all cities are being contested, as these futures are increasingly seen as reflective of a violence yet to come, leading to a global restructuring of geographies with widespread calls to erect walls, both literally and figuratively, to shut out unwanted populations. Does not the everyday anticipation of violence, terror, war, climate change, and police and gang violence affect all of our daily lives as we walk through militarized urban spaces, retreat to our gated communities, travel through airports, build prisons and border walls? Hope remains, however, in the prospect <laughs> that <laughs> hope remains. <laughs> Hope remains, however, in the prospect that these logics of fear and exclusion will be widely contested and that these contestations will give rise to movements that bring on new spatial and political imaginaries for more equitable cities and better futures while reminding us that the future is yet to be written. Thank you. Um, 
that the title of the book for the war yet to come is a play with uh, the title of Abdul Malik Simon's book, uh, which is in is in conversation with. The book was called For the City Yet to Come. That was a very influential volume published in the late 1990s, which took to task the Eurocentrism of planning theories and planning scholarship, which kind of assumes that what happens outside the Western models of planning is not planning. So he focused on four cities in the global south and the everyday making special practices of people and showing that these cities are surviving and, and um, why they don't fit into the uh, model of Western planning. We cannot assume that there is no planning going on, but by, by expanding the notion of planning to include the everyday practices of regular people that make the city and make their communities and neighborhoods work. So he is uh, taking to task the, the uh, global north theories of planning um, in that book. I think is an interplay with what Hiva is doing in her book, which she is focusing on a uh, dark side of planning as something that again, northern uh, in the northern and the planning theories rooted in the uh, Western liberal democratic notions of planning is kind of often not talked about or not uh, seen. So with that, um, uh, um, the kind of practices and the kind of dark side of planning that Hiva just described and shared with us here and is in the book is something that doesn't appear in the radar of planning scholarship. Uh, in the opening keynote of uh, World Congress of Planning Schools, um, in, which I did um, two years ago in Brazil, I talked about something uh, that I call it planning schizophrenia. To describe precisely what I believe Heba's book contributes to, to challenge. The planning schizophrenia is that the way in which in planning theories we want to think about planning as something that is for public good. The, the purpose of the profession is to serve the good, um, the, the shared interest of the public. But when we look at the actual on the ground practices of planning profession, we see these dark sides that some of which was shared with us. So in that opening remark, I basically shared some of the examples of how we see the schizophrenia of planning um, and laying bare when, for example, the public housing uh, project in Chicago was um, demolished and with the promise that we would replace them with mixed use housing and having more inclusive uh, cities and um, residential areas, it ended up really getting replaced by a very um, expensive um, condominiums that are now today rented at $3,000 per month, those sites of displacement of what used to be the uh, Chicago projects. Um, the schizophrenia of planning is also uh, laid bare when we see um, many examples, but for example, uh, the, the case that I would um, briefly mention is the Mumbai transportation plan, which has um, kind of justified their multi-billion dollar project with building uh, this uh, 33 kilometers of under the water and bridges and overpass through the ocean to connect the bay as a way of creating more connected and inclusive and accessible city, while in reality what it does, it upsets the ecology um, of, of the coastal area and displaces much of the fishing communities in the area. And these kind of um, examples of how the narrative of planning is that we are doing inclusive or um, planning for the public good actually on the reality displaces and has been a complicit in this possession. Go, could go on and on. So, in, in those opening remarks, and in much of what my own writing has concerned, I make the case for rethinking planning and its Eurocentric theorization, which um, at its best 
reflects a brief moment, brief historical moment in the um, European and American or in the Western societies, even in the in the uh, Euro-American experience, even in the liberal democratic so-called uh, societies, this mm, expectation that planning could be the mediating force between the people and the, you know, the state that is willing to give has only existed for a brief moment of a strong welfare state. But if, today, even in the West, this, this uh, schizophrenia is completely um, is laid bare. So what um, the uh, Hewa's work does and is making a uniquely forceful contribution and lending a voice to this conversation by showing the dark side, by exposing the dark side of planning profession and precisely by doing it in a context where the assumption is there is no planning. The opening of the book and throughout we see that not only the people but only planners themselves have bought into that we are not doing really planning here. So in one conversation with Levi later on in the book, the professional Beiruti planner says, why are you here? This is not really planning. Planning is what happens in, you know, uh, Western societies, which is really what is how it is. The, the, uh, the common sense of planning has spread out even to societies in, uh, so to speak, global south. So what is beautiful and effective about the book is that she takes one of such spaces, that the assumption is there is no planning happening here, and professional planners have nothing to do with this, and yet in that context, she is able to expose that planning, professional planning, has been thoroughly involved in production and reproduction of these spaces of war and um, separate, um, separate and separation. I turn now to my second point. I'm not going to extend my 10 minutes. So the second point is regarding the, the methodological contribution of she uh, makes an important methodological invention, in intervention by using a relational approach that is based, is uh, created through doing careful uh, multi sided ethnography of several um, neighborhoods, suburbs, or frontiers, as she called them. By doing such careful relational analysis, she is able to rise above convenient binaries of formal, informal, state and non-state authorities, local and global actors, and book achieves this by um, engaging analytically with religious secta sectarian differences. The very uh, differences that have been often used to offer binary readings <coughs> of urban divides. So she takes a the sectarian divides, which is often very easily lending itself to saying, well, we have Shia, Sunni, we have this, that, right? And even in that scenario, which doesn't come easy across as common sense, so to speak, then she shows that these are not really binaries and the reality of urban urbanism and urban life doesn't fit into these clean categories of state, non-state, civil society, citizens here, state here, by showing a range of what she calls state-like actors who <coughs> fall in and out of realm of the state in kind of um, inter uh, actions they do. So this is very important in what she accomplishes by taking a case that seems to be out of, you know, <coughs> seems to be not easily possible to argue against, you know, challenge of binary constructions, and yet she is able to show that. Following the footsteps of anthropologist Anna Singh, I could see she seeks to show the frictions, the non-binary interrelatedness that is not smooth, but full of contradictions and tensions, frictions that shape the southern urbanism, <coughs> cannot fit into clean containers, as I said, such as a state citizens in a civil society. Um, she reveals the complex politics of belonging 
where divides are not simply given. They are produced, reinforced, and contested by citizens, states, and authorities of different kinds. Citizens and a combination of formal and informal and authorities resist the borders between these urban divides shaped through relational dynamics. In this process, we see both hardening and permeability of boundaries, which she refers to them as frontiers. So um, to, to wrap up basically for uh, the war yet to come, by overcoming the analytical limitations of binary thinking and, ex and explaining urban divides uh, co-constitutively and relationally challenges the convenient conventional Western models of planning yet through its methodological approach. Uh, my own work using relational multi-sided you know, um, ethnography, which a couple of days ago I shared with the students and um, some faculty here, draws on flexibility of showing the phenomena from multiple locations and points in order to really see what is going on. In my case, I, took, I went around from Togo to Mexico to be able to see how um, the lace work of care performed around the world to keep body and soul together for workers in the lucrative meat industry of the U.S. Frostbelt. And Hiba does it beautifully to show how the urban divide is um, happening, uh, facilitated and reinforced through lace work of zoning. It is only through a careful relational approach that we can reveal the complexities, frictions, and assemblages of urban space and urban divide in cities built for the war yet to come. I stop here, but I wish to also again thank Giva for writing a book for my students now and for my students yet to come. <laughs> that he was setting up a fundraising organization, a, a super PAC, that he was going to call Americans for a Better Tomorrow, Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> its slogan, he announced, was going to be, we'll be making a better tomorrow, tomorrow, today. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Why not donate, he said, to his new super PAC. That way, you can ensure, ensure that your voice is heard. If by voice you mean money and by heard you mean positive. <laughs> he was, of course, um, satirizing political fundraising in the US, and particularly that, that was in the wake of, of the Citizens United decision. But I think there was also something more to learn from that slogan, a better tomorrow, tomorrow, today. I think it captures something more about the way we live in relation to the future. And I think it's that something that is captured uh, so expertly in this book. Um, of course, there's, there's no more prevalent way in which we uh, organize and conceive our relationship to the future, perhaps, um, than through uh, modes of, of, of development and of development planning. Um, an entire uh, world of writing and thinking about modernization. Um, it is, of course, it has been throughout the last century or more, 
um, an invitation to live one's life in terms of a better tomorrow, tomorrow, today. In other words, it's the deployment of a future promise as a mode of organizing in the present. Uh, it's a mode of regulation through deferment. Um, I think of it as a mode of making the future enter government, enter the way we are governed, a means of governing people through what they lack, through what they cannot have today. We're, of course, told again and again that development as imminent as a political project has largely failed. Um, it never properly worked. Uh, the planning failed again and again. Um, and of course we've lived in the last generation through an entire political project organized around the apparent problem of the failure of planning, neoliberalism. Um, what Hayek called, Friedrich Hayek called, of course, the plan to end planning. Um, the market is an alternative device to producing the future, the future uh, a, a device which itself has failed. Now, if one thinks this way of, of our sort of condition as one of being governed by a particular mode of producing the future, a promise today of a tomorrow, tomorrow, I, I can think of three questions that follow. Um, what happens when that promised future doesn't arrive? Second, other, other kinds of future than those of development that can be deployed, futures that are not futures of improvement, um, futures that are not based on a logic of, of growth and human betterment. And how do they work? And more specifically indeed, how does this deployment of the future work? Is it just something fictitious, a set of promises that um, fill the imagination and then um, somehow take control of our minds, um, continually fool us and mislead us with promises? Or is it built in other ways, uh, with more solid elements, uh, with more material and technical apparatus? I encourage you to read Heber's book as an answer to all three of those questions. Um, I think there are many other reasons to read it. Um, above all, uh, I think you get this most wonderful uh, uh, ethnography of Beirut, and a Beirut in which you feel very much her own presence, her own family, but her own intense involvement in um, trying to understand the world of her um, interlocutors. And um, I wish I could say more about that aspect of the book. Um, I wish I knew Beirut in the way that, e even in you know, a tenth or, 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 or a percent of the way in which she does. The, the, the one city in the region that I've got to know a little bit is Cairo, and even that I, I, I completely um, fail to appreciate with the kind of depth she had Beirut. I did, I've been a few times, and I did actually once, um, uh, was fortunate enough to be invited by AUB and to spend three months uh, living in, um, uh, in that part of Beirut. I, I never saw the southern suburbs in those three months, I'm afraid to say. Um, I never saw the northern suburbs. I never saw the eastern suburbs. <laughs> Uh, I was finishing a book. <laughs> <laughs> Carver Democracy benefited from that wonderful place and that wonderful environment and the apartment that AUB gave me the use of for those three months and, and the, the one particular street outside with the wonderful restaurants. Well, I, I was told actually that my legs atrophied in those three months. How little did I do to explore the country? And I, I, I still feel, and one of the pleasures of reading the book was to be taken vicariously back to the, the parts of the city that I really failed to, to experience. And so I would encourage you to read it for all those reasons as well. Um, 
But while it is a wonderful um, uh, account of a history and a current <coughs> experience of Beirut, it's not just an exploration of a case. Um, and it is, as I've suggested, the conceptual tools that um, she has given us that make it such a, a rich book. Um, there's the one in the title that I'm going to come up to, come back to, but there are several others. Each chapter is organized around a concept, um, lacework, ballooning, and so on. Um, she has, uh, she argues for a concept of planning without development that we have to think about seriously. Um, she talks about the idea of the frontier, the way in which Beirut cannot be grasped in terms of center and periphery, the formal versus the informal, a core and an expanding frontier. And in each of those terms, she takes us through a different way of conceiving of the kinds of things that have usually been organized under those um, kinds of rubrics. But it is this yet to come um, that seems to me the most original and the most um, important aspect of the book. I, I think um, to grasp its importance, you have to remember how um, handicapped we are by the sort of historicism that envelops our way of thinking about the future, our historical mode of thinking, in which time is something <coughs> largely linear, the present is what is real, the past is what is over, but that exists for us in fragments, in ruins that are explored in very interesting ways in the book, um, that may survive into the present that allow us to rebuild it. But the future, no, the future is unreal. Um, if it has an effect, it's only going to be through our imagination. We build it in our heads. That's not what you get from reading this book. Um, the future is something being built in concrete. The future is something being built in material ways, through systems of, of debt and real estate financing, through the durability of iron and steel. Um, the ruin in Heber's account um, is not just something recovered and still standing from the past, but it also works to mark the future in a particular way, as a place of abandonment, and the present as a place which has no way forward and no way back, because of the way the ruin locks a neighborhood into a sectarian order. I don't want to overstep my time, but I could talk more about this concept of lacework that she deploys in another chapter, the negotiated fabric of openings and closures constructed through a planning process. I didn't quite find it as dark. I mean, maybe that would, I, I, I was just too excited by it, something. Um, it's certainly not, um, <laughs> it's not light, but, um, but, but, but there is something quite redeeming in a way about the, 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 the ways in which, as you call it, planning without development is shown to be a, a, a mode of operation. Um, I also found really useful um, the discussion of the way in which the notion of something being under study, under review, is used, a planning term but also a way of thinking about a whole mode of politics. Um, you know, for, for our thinking, our normal thinking, the future is something imagined, it's something in Marx's writing that was fictitious, capital derived from the future for Marx was fictitious capital. But that's not how the future works in this book. The yet to come is not a promised future. It's not an imaginary future. Rather, as she said, it's a particular horizon shaping the present, and present into present. It's a set of future possibilities and potentials for violence, for profit, and a very important theme of the book, for survival, that operate and is mobilized uh, in the present as a temporal regime. Um, let me end by 
is suggesting also when you read the book that um, yes, it's important to think about how uh, concepts of planning or thinking about planning um, expand to include uh, places outside the Euro-American world. Um, and the book indeed suggests that this I example of Beirut can be taken as a much broader example of um, how things might work in, in many parts of the global south. Um, but isn't it equally relevant for thinking about the north? Um, in, in two ways that come immediately to mind. Um, so this is the war yet to come, but it's also about a book about the yet to come. And the yet to come might be configured in one case as war, in other cases as other kinds of calamity or, 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 or even normalcy. Of course, since October of 2001, since the U.S. launched its war on terror, the U.S. has been continuously <coughs> at war. Um, not a war to come, but a war that has become a permanent condition of U.S. society, of the form of its cities and um, its political life. Um, as you know, Afghanistan is now the longest war in U.S. history. Um, the U.S. is currently involved in bombing or other kinds of, directly or supporting other kinds of um, warfare in at least half a dozen countries in the Middle East and broader military op operations in 75 countries around the world. That is, I'm told, four out of every ten countries in the world. So, um, the way in which uh, war and the, the kinds of futures that a permanent state of not war, not peace, that Hitler is writing about in Beirut, shape our political condition it seems to me not just a lesson for how do we study the global south, but it seems a lesson for how we think about our uh, condition when we are based even in the north. And of course, let me end by reminding us that we live with another future in the present, another yet to come, um, that we still haven't developed the proper tools perhaps for thinking about um, uh, politically, and that would be the, 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 the yet to come, that is not just an imagined future, of, of climate change and ecological collapse. Okay. Um, one that is of course with us in the present, but is configured as a yet to come, <coughs> configures our present in terms of the yet to come. Uh, here and equally of course in Beirut, we're now fairly certain that the fertile crescent, that great arc of land passing up the coast of, of uh, the eastern Mediterranean and across to Iraq, the Fertile Crescent is finished. The rivers will dry up on our present political course. Um, the, uh, and, and, and in many respects that is already happening if you look at what is happening to agriculture in Iraq or in Syria. The drought that is the worst, that is currently still ongoing, that is the worst drought in 800 years and is a major cause of the war in Syria and hence of the issue of, of, of Syrian refugees in Beirut and other parts of Lebanon. Um, I think in this book one can find, as I say, in this concept of the yet to come, ways to think about the, the very impoverished terms we've got for making sense of um, how the future uh, governs or fails to govern our lives. Um, it's depressing. <laughs> but thanks to this book, hope remains. <laughs>
So, you know, I said yes because it's not very far away from my home to come up to Columbia to speak. I very seldom am here. And I thought maybe this is a good opportunity. Uh, but you cannot imagine the pleasure, and I will say pleasure I had in reading this book over the weekend. It is a detailed book. It is, um, it, it is so far above what we, anybody can summarize that it requires you to read it. Now, why am I here? Is it because I have friends from Beirut? Miriam Saeed is here, she's a good friend. Um, uh, yes, Amal is from Beirut, I can believe. Um, colleagues are from, you also sent readings from um, uh, Marwan Gando from the University of Iowa. He's a good colleague and friend. Maybe, maybe somehow something came across. Why am I here? Because you've written a story about the peripheries of Beirut and how they have been transformed into sectarian frontiers of a war yet to come. I think you've heard enough about that. And she asked, in a contested city such as Beirut, how is land use, zoning, building permits, laissez-faire real estate markets uh, used as tools of this war? yet to come. And what I want to emphasize is all of you who are studying planning, don't go away thinking planning is the dark side of planning. It has a dark side. But it's the tools of planning that are misused by various groups that your book absolutely uh, covers. And perhaps you are perplexed by the interviews of professional planners because she says, what happened to the normative view of planners as agents of a better future, promoters of a city that is spatially ordered, being socially responsible experts on the side of social justice, equity, progress, how do they get sidelined and their tools, which are, are for a future yet to come, to be a better future, get misused by different groups. And these questions she answers in the context of, of three different periods of time. And development planning of the 1950s and 60s, then planning um, as uh, development in the 60s and 70s, and then a shift again to the 1990s to planning without development. So development is part of this book, but only part of the book. So on a quest for trying to figure out why I was invited, and because I too have been asking what happened to the social responsibility of architects and planners since the 1970s, and we might think of 50 years ago here in upstairs Avery Hall, um, and uh, the Jim Crow must go, uh, that rang out across the campus, um, and alternative architecture groups such as Homefront, an arch that was set up. And in general, why has the gap between physical planning and architecture remained so large since the 1970s, which it has? So I've been struggling this afternoon in particular with editing an essay entitled Planning the Rumination of the Gaza Strip. Now, I don't have the language skills that Eva has. And I don't have the opportunity to be on the ground to interview people, as you have so fantastically done. So um, I'm struggling with this. Um, Israel and the international community have never had plans for the Gaza Strip to keep the land and the people in a perpetually precarious situation seems to be the, the plan. But without a planning fr framework, there's been little to direct foreign humanitarian aid toward anything but short-term projects. There are no land use plans to guide the physical development of Gaza cities and refugee camps. Hence, most of its constructions are informal um, with inadequate infrastructure and service provisions. And how can any planning system kept in permanent temporariness guide, let alone control, the development of its towns and cities or protect its agricultural lands and uh, fishing areas. So maybe that is somehow in the air that you knew about, but it hasn't been printed yet. I'm 
I'm still working on it. I'm still trying to struggle through how planning as tools have been misused uh, and kept uh, the Gaza Strip in a state of ruination. But I have also written a series of essays on New Orleans and the Katrina effect. And in, uh, one of them in particular is titled The Ruination of New Orleans and the Planners <coughs> of Injustice. And my questions there are, did the recovery plans increase the ruination of the citizens of New Orleans? Did the very process of planning, of citizens' participation, of the reliance on outside planning consultants who could dream up big plans and bypass the local politics and pragmatic approach of the City Planning Commission, did all of these accumulate to a prolonged period of recovery planning that resulted in a slow motion release of recovery funds for the neighborhoods that were most in need. Faced with one of the largest catastrophes to hit an American city, did the scale of the disaster impede the development of rational schemes by planners who by nature are pro-growth, the managers of physical development, rather than experts who could bring New Orleans back from ruination? The federal authorities wanted to know where and on what recovery aid would be spent. They required a recovery plan be in place before any funds could be released. In spite of the fact that the federal aid, the authorities, their own subcontracting <coughs> pyramid to private corporations for deb debris removal, for temporary housing, for securing and delivering all kinds of recovery aid would make it impossible for them to come up with a plan of how and where they were spending the money. So my argument goes that the very act of recovery with its slow, almost stalled process of planning was the cause of a continued ruination of New Orleans. Well, I have also looked a little bit into development planning in the 1950s, and I think this is where actually the invitation comes from, but I'll be very brief about this. This is a little work on Doxialis. Uh, it's well known, the containment theory, the domino effect of communism in the 1950s, and so Doxialis and his trip, his adventures to Baghdad, as I call them, in the mid-1950s, has been written about quite a bit. But my take is a little bit different than that. I uh, asked two different questions, and that is, why was the fledging architectural office of Doxialis invited to develop a national housing plan for Iraq in 1955? And secondly, why did the Ford Foundation fund Doxialis to the grand accumulation of $5 million, going back to those at uh, those times, not our times of $5 million, in 1955, and uh, a few years later invite uh, him to volunteer a master program for the entire uh, city of Baghdad. Excuse me, I just jumbled up what I was trying to say. But anyway, why did they give him so much money? And the answer to these questions, as I elaborate in my talk on Doxia, this has everything to do with a need for information. And as the world well knows, information about the Middle East in Washington, D.C. in the 50s and 60s at the height of the Cold War and up to and including the 21st century opens over a gaping void. There is no doubt in my mind that Constantinos Darciades and the Athens Center of Kistics was intent on databasing the world. And I will leave that uh, point uh, to a later elaboration, but information collecting seemed to be why the U.S. government, the Ford Foundation, were very happy to have in place around the Middle East, gathering as much information on serifas, on informal settlements, on anything that might possibly tip toward um, the cold, tip the Cold War. But I want to close, as everybody else has, on focusing on the title, on the war yet to come, focusing on the phrase, the city yet to come, um, developed by Abdul Malik Simon, as uh, Eva has um, acknowledged. His is a hopeful concept of entrepreneurial activity, of self-help and sharing interrelationships among people, of local involvement and resistance in African and Indonesian cities. 
Eva takes this and inverts this hopeful concept into the dystopian development for the war yet to come in the planning of Beirut's peripheries. And in contested cities, perhaps the dystopian plans are what we've heard called the dark side of planning. The dystopian plans for wars yet to come are dominant factors overriding any hope of resisting. But maybe, maybe there's another way to theorize what is to come and what Abdul Malik Simon calls the capacity to deliver the same melody in a different way. Mm -hmm. He reports on the lives of many in Africa and Indonesia cities, and he notes the potential for the precariousness to refuse discrimination imposed on their lives by the capitalist market economy. Simon writes that endurance for large numbers of urban residents is predicated on indifference to and acts of detachment from prevailing modes of urban power. He explains that the property regime, and here's a long quote from it, is replete with scams and shortcuts and cross-cutting measures, broken agreements, messed up contracts, plans gone wrong, fights within and between municipal and state ministries, architecture firms, consultancies, contractors, property developers, construction firms, infrastructure regime, planners, local and prospective residents. All of them are players in your fantastic book. So in these voids and these interstitches of power between the specifics engendered experimentation of the informal thrives on this indifference. Instead of seeing this insufficiency as subtraction, exclusion, or segregation, Simon suggests that we envision urban space and infrastructure in a different manner. Rather than seeing them as connectors and communicators, he suggests to keep things out of any analytical connection and think the potential of the marginal, the useless, and the anachronistic in new ways. And consequently, precarity holds doom, yes, the dark side, the, the misuse of tools of planning, um, but also potential. So I wrote a lot of this, uh, hard to know where to start, but I, so I thought I'd start also quite personally with it. Uh, you know, I, uh, especially lately, or let's say it's been now maybe a couple of years, I, um, I'm, you know, I was born in Beirut, but I didn't really grow up there, and yet whenever I go, I always feel like, it's, you know, if one understood Beirut, one would understand this moment we are in. Uh, and, uh, and I think about, uh, there, there's a feeling when one is there being, uh, both incredibly alive and possibly dead or something, right? It's very hard, entangled in the realities of every moment. It's a kind of very powerful uh, feeling that almost doesn't allow a distancing or a kind of zooming out. And, um, and, and I think there's a kind of incredible tension in the book where you're, as Christine said, you know, super detailed, and so you think it's impossible to theorize anything, right? I have a, a colleague architect who wrote a book that I'm fully called Local Heroes with a complete resistance to, you know, getting slightly off of the ground, and he never wants to get off of the ground, and yet you you manage to to get off the ground, kind of constantly moving in and out, and I think some of the, the concepts that Tim mentions, lease work, frontier, uh, planning without development on the study and I, I thought a kind of eternal present or something uh, uh, rather than the, in the future and the past um, are, are actually the beginning of, of concepts that we can turn back or uh, turn towards uh, um, the north or towards any city or towards any place and and so maybe I want to start there which is and I think it was mentioned obviously it's not about um, finally turning to the global south and learning about it, but, but rather um, kind of turning things on their heads and, and finding in uh, these, these places that are just uh, seemingly a mess the tools actually to understand and, and theorize and kind of gain distance, you know, in the, in the city we are in, in this moment we are in. Because time plays a, 
with a great part I think, in the book uh, in ways that we don't think about but in other books in language. So maybe I would start here by like giving you a chance to respond to some of the you know, comments and readings of, of, of the book in, in that sense. Thank you so much. Everyone was you, thank you for being so generous. I really appreciate everything. Thank you. Um, yeah, for the warrior to come. Uh, For the warrior to come is actually, and it, although it's very much uh, rooted in Beirut, uh, the whole the whole theorization of that book tried to decenter urban theory and planning theory, which is what I teach, from the global north and from what we learn. And the thing is that actually uh, most of these theories talk about what we what ought to happen, but not actually what happens on the ground. And so when I started getting interesting and having lived this life and getting interested in these questions, I was interested on. So how do we know what's happening on the ground? So what we can theorize that plan, we can do this to plan for the future, or forecast this, or use this data, or this map, but how do we actually know what's going on the ground? And there are very few studies of, of how planning is actually function, actually functions. How do people eventually take these planning tools, and what do they do with them in their everyday life? And so this is where I started an ethnography of spatial practices, which is I, I started seeing these maps and trying to analyze them, and I started following their production, going from one office to the other, from people on the ground, talking to residents who live in these neighborhoods, but then going up to the officials and trying to see how they're thinking about it. And then I started learning a lot about what is actually planning on the ground. And it's not one thing, it's not one theory the way we teach it. It's multiple tools that people are trying to make sense of how they live in their everyday life as people, but also the officials or the planners themselves, how they can act within the constraints or within, within such a political, political geography. So this is a relationship to Beirut, it's trying to understand how planning actually functions on the ground and Beirut as one example of trying to talk back or speak back or speak with the planning theory, planning theory and like how, uh, how scholars theorize about plan. But also, this is one thing that's the on the ground. But then, also rethinking about the temporalities of planning. So for the longest time, we've been thinking about, as I said, this future that's always like, that somehow guides everything we study or we teach, that it's going to definitely be bright. It's going to always be good. But I mean, if you, um, if you live in a place, if you take this case to the extreme, which is an extreme of war and violence, if people live under displacement, under, under the fear of war, then you can actually see how the future is not always like what we studying charts and diagrams and linear progress time that is actually missed mostly for the dominant groups, but it's most, more cyclical time for the others. It's cyclical times for the racialized, gendered, for the people, uh, for the refugees, for the climate refugees, for the war refugees. So it's this uh, incentive of trying to bring the two perspectives together where I wrote this book. Actually, um, I think that Tim, you uh, sort of highlighted that is that um, uh, it's a different mode. It, it, if there's no hope, it doesn't mean that it's dark <laughs> somehow. And then you see that in almost conversations. It's a different form of conversation. People have their, they're just enjoying each other's company. And it's not about just living in the present. It's something different. And I wanted to hear maybe more about uh, uh, because it is beyond light and dark, right? And what is this other mode of planning or of being that would necessarily project a, a, you know, a better betterment somehow? And yeah, yeah. Um, so as, as Pippa was just mentioning, um, one of the distinctive things about the book, and you mentioned this in your comments at the beginning as well, is this um, ethnography of the planners themselves as they are embedded in this world that they are planning. And I think that's part of the reason we don't get just a sense of despair, because they are actually people who come across in the book as, as people who believe in what they do. And um, uh, even if they developed a certain very specific sense of what under these circumstances planning can be, what you refer to as planning without development. Um, but at the same time, they are these interests.
interest in planning, planners, of course, were the great social engineers. Um, uh, excuse me, I'm going to be here. Um, uh, that, um, you know, that sense of what a, a social engineer can be in a situation that would, to an outsider, seem one of such despair, is, I think, um, because they do work with, a, in, in your account, they, it, it, I mean, from the negative point of view, they're doing this thing called planning without development, but they are actually working with a certain um, theory, if you like, of, of <coughs> the kind of society um, Beirut or these particular suburbs of Beirut could be. The, the planner are sort of social theorist, um, seem to me, and, and what kind of social theorist the planner himself or herself becomes in these kinds of circumstances. That is just one example to me of how this is not either despair on the one hand or, or failure on the other, but people trying to sort of make a world work um, even, even under these conditions. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I totally, yeah, this is also my take, because when, when I talk about race, I mean, if people are totally segregated, they're just doing the war, Mm -hmm. and they separate each other. Actually, the fact that there's lace work and balloon actually provides these opportunities for continuous uh, engagement, despite mm -hmm. sometimes the fights. And so this is where, but also, while it's dark, it provides spaces for engagement. Yeah, and lace work was the word you actually took from one of your plans. So that was your, your, your um, yeah. English translation yeah. of a particular term mm -hmm. that he was using, which was, again, the plan of the social theorists. Mm -hmm. And they all use the same tools. Right. I mean, it doesn't ma matter whether you're Hezbollah or you're mm -hmm. your movement or you're all, use, you know, using kind of, you know, or not. Yeah, they all, they all use the master plan, the real estate. They all, I mean, the, the thing is about these actors is that they they are the government. They are the they are the entities that people go and vote for in the boxes. So they constitute the state, but they also operate all these things outside the state. And so sometimes, depending on what they need, they either mobilize their their ability to be inside the state, and sometimes they mobilize what's outside the state. And this is actually what challenges some of the urban pl and planning theory, which usually assumes an easy binary between a private actor or like what is private and what is public. And it's usually like clear, this is public, this is private. But these actors challenge this binary, and then becomes, it's very, it becomes a question of how to understand geographic production when these actors are both the state and, not the, and outside the state. They, are, uh, this, they establish together the sovereignty of the state, i.e. like the formal president uh, army, but at the same time they are the paramilitary groups when wars get fought, are fought. So they are both. And what does that mean for geographic production? But yes, they all use near the state, they all use uh, zoning, uh, building permits, and they're not always fighting because if you know the uh, politics of Lebanon, um, these alliances are always shifting. Some of these people are on this side together, then they like split and they're on the other side. And so sometimes they're cooperating on these zones and sometimes they're like making pla different other plans and fighting with each other. So it keeps changing. And this is where I question this sectarianism or this uh, especially journalistic accounts and this simp uh, simple or simplistic, let's say, portrayal of the Middle East as like sectarian and this is a sectarian neighborhood and this is and rethinking from an ethnographic point of view, from thinking about on the, how things are done on the ground, how actually these things are produced, how, how they are uh, produced temporally and spatially. For example, some of the real estate uh, transactions that I, um, I learned about in 2004 were considered no normal real estate transactions, like a uh, developer bought a land from a landowner and they just built housing, shared some apartments uh, to pay back some of the cost of the land. These same real estate transactions, when I was doing fieldwork in 2009-2011, they were cast completely in a completely different light, as like a Islamization of the Middle East, as like uh, against the minorities. These same land transactions. So the the attempt of this book also to, is to debunk these kind of sectarian assumptions and to, to see how it's produced over time. And the hope is in that it, it will change. <laughs> I want to maintain the hope. <laughs> I want to add uh, to what was just said about um, the, the, if you consider what is happening within the broader planning literature, if we call it a movement of theorizing from the perspective of global south, 
it doesn't mean, first of all, it's, I, I, I believe that this audience would know that we are not talking about Global South as a geographic, so the messiness of planning exists in um, the U.S., the south of Chicago, all those communities that are subordinated, <coughs> if you call them Global South of the world, different places of the world, then how could planning theories and theorization reflect that messiness that exists in South Chicago, exists in New Orleans, as you were saying, exists in Lebanon, right? But in, in the, the, the problem is that the canon of the scholarship, the literature, the, the planning theories, doesn't want to deal with the messiness of planning. That in reality is not that clean cut, that you know, whatever is doesn't fit into that clean cut, then it's kind of almost labeled as not being planning, being developer's work. But where do you clean, decide that this is developer's work, this is planner's work, and then the grassroots activists that are building the houses or occupying land or making livelihood or you know, shaping the communities that is in planning or in the out of planning. So there is really time now, and that is the movement of that, if you call it global south urbanism and theorizing from that perspective, is to acknowledge, and dark side doesn't mean that all of planning is bad or all of that, but acknowledging the messiness of it, which is much more easier and visible to see in the global south. And that doesn't mean only Lebanon, it also means south of Chicago. If you visit, you see how people are themselves patching and this kind of uh, creative uh, energy that makes the, the planning happen. So I think that is the contribution of the book for me, was that the ethnography of the profession. So if Simone focused on how people on everyday basis are making the space, what he was working that she didn't only focus on everyday actors, but she brought those professional planners who don't themselves want to accept that they are part of this mess, brought them into the conversation that how it goes back and forth between them. And it's very hard to make those lines and say, this is professional planning, that is developers, this is activists, political activists, and they all bleed into each other. So maybe t it is time for us, in terms of planning theorization, to recognize the messiness of planning and, you know, shift the canon to, towards that. So that's what I think. Well, and I think you do help with that. <laughs> but I think you also do help with um, actually bridging the gap that Christine, you were mentioning between architecture and planning, because it, it's the same thing with architecture. I mean, I, I kept feeling, reading these same parallels, and through the messiness of kind of engaging in the reality of the daily practices of architecture, you know, you realize that <coughs> that gap is one that was created in academia, uh, not so much uh, in, in practice. I don't know, Christine, how do you feel about the gap <coughs> today? <laughs> well, I, 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 does this work? Yes, yeah, it does. <laughs> um, I think the gap still exists, but I probably err on the side of speaking with architects rather than with planners, so I'm not sure that I am a good representative of, of saying where planning is at this point. However, the tools of zoning, New York City, we don't have to go too far away to Chicago, or even to New Orleans, much as I'd like to go. But we can just go to the South Bronx and look at St. Jerome Avenue, which the city has been fighting to upzone. And it's urban design. It's, it's uh, more architecture to build higher and better and taller buildings at higher runs and so forth. Um, yes, they do have to have zoning be agreed by the City Planning Commission, but there's also the community that's very, very involved. Or we could go over to Williamsport and look at what's happened with the Gold Coast of high rise that Bloomberg pushed through. And yes, inclusionary zoning is part of it. I don't think of that as planning so much as I think it's a physical development, whether real estate people are handling it, whether architects are pushing for it, whether it happens to be in you know, the purview of the city planning department and so on. It's what is happening to the physical development of cities. And I think you know some of the fantastic stories that are in your book 
part, for instance, we saw the photograph of the Maronite church with the bombed out building that's next to it. That church can manipulate all the tools without thinking about what's planning or what's architecture and so forth, but manipulate those tools so it can keep that building empty so that the enemy, the other, cannot buy it and even change the code so that you could only sell to a Maronite, even though the Maronites have, the parishioners have moved away from the district. The book is filled with these details about how zoning is manipulated by one group or another to get their end, which is to make their territory ready for war and war against the other. And I would say we just don't use the same vocabulary when we come to think about physical development of our cities in the north, in the global north. Um, but they certainly exist, and that's what I think is really useful of your book. It is not just about Beirut. It really is about the way these tools are being manipulated um, for uh, uh, very competitive reasons. And it helps to think about. There's nothing short of a conflict over land use. That's what development is. One group wants it, the other group doesn't. One group is going to be pushed out, the other isn't. Um, and we all have to take part of it and manipulate the tools. I just want to sort of go back to the notion of ethnography here, that I think is really quite original because the, 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 the discussion is that neither of a planner nor an architect, but with the sensibilities of both, and but working as an ethnographer who has, you know, it's the classic ethnography of the street corner and the balcony. And, and the, the, in the real estate transaction at the local level, it's also zoning at the higher level, and it's the planning offices and the maps. And ethnography uh, is seldom that sort of multi-level and interesting. And I think you take a beautiful distance, and you bring the richness of that detail of those human experiences on the street corners, at the shop, or looking out the window. And then you also quote the architects and the planners and this, this is what ethnography can be at its very best. And I think that's a, an amazing thing to have accomplished. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Maybe we want to take a couple questions. Maybe we open it up for a couple of questions from the audience. Yes. 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 scientist and uh, don't know much about architecture except uh, New York real estate. But um, I have a lot of friends who are in uh, Beirut, uh, the Israeli army. Um, and I just didn't hear any words here about politics. You mentioned God. But what's the story now with, uh, I mean, do you have any feelings for the influence of the political situation with the Hezbollah and the Maronites in Iran and this is all very wonderful on the level of planning and intellectual or whatever. Also, you guys never mentioned the word money. It's unbelievable. Nobody in the academic world mentions the word money. It's just there's, there's a lot of money. A lot of money. <laughs> and I wish I had the answer for your first question. I mean, they themselves, whatever wars they're doing in the Middle East. Um, I mean, definitely these are not only local wars, these are very connected to what's going on, but even themselves, like the war, uh, lords turned uh, politicians don't really understand. Sometimes they do, sometimes they're not, but they're always in this mode of preparation for something. No one, it doesn't matter whether this war is going to come or not, that's not what it is. It's actually this, this horizon of war and its anticipation is what ends up shaping. What is the war, by the way? I mean, I hate to be stupid. But I came in here and said, for the war yet to come, what is the war? <laughs> I know. I walked in off the street. I'm sorry. That's very soft. Anyone to ask a question? So, I can certainly relate to that creation of the Beirut being structured with that information for war and clashes. And I can see that in different Mediterranean cities. However, I, I assume that the situation of Beirut is unique because the different political and religious powers have real, real political power and economic power. So I have three questions. One question. One. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. One, one question to finalist. So, okay. In a way, it seems in your 
your subtext that you, you assume it is a really good planning, not a good planning, a really active, active planning of the different groups for their own community, like developing their own neighborhood. Is it right? Is it like a different party, party leaders working to develop only their interest? And my second question is regarding the... <laughs> Like coming from the Palestinian Israeli reality, I was wondering about the possibility of mass displacement in our modern times. We see it happening in different parts of the world, and especially in Beirut. Is it like possible in this modern era? I think it's possible. You're asking about whether mass displacement is possible? Yeah, changing like the reality of the city, moving masses from one place to another, taking control of it. She read the book. Just for the record, I So, so I'd like to take you back to that hopeful moment that you ended with. Um, I know that you work with, in Beirut, a number of groups and movements. Um, I, I'm thinking of groups like Public Works and Legal Agenda, and folks at AUB who are very much engaged with issues of master planning, with issues of creating a discourse around public space and public good. How do you see, what, what is, tell us more about the hope and how you see your research connecting to some of these movements on the ground. Yeah. So actually, uh, the hope is mostly in, rather than thinking of using urban planning as this idea to uh, forecast a future that actually no one can control or know. Mm -hmm. What has been happening in the ground and that, I'm, that is I'm, uh, something that I'm part of is using urban planning tools as a medium of negotiation, of engagement, to imagine a different horizon. So it's not like that you will do this for this, you, you, you forecast something and then you put it in a plan and that's what's going to happen in the future. But then can you use discussions over public spaces? Can you bring together community engagement to open up a horizon across sectarian divides with, with locals and officials and civil groups and urban professionals to imagine a certain kind of, a different kind of space? So rather than just using these tools to imagine that you can actually shape the future, which is probably yes, probably no, uh, actually use it as a way in which to open conversations and create a different kind of dialogue than this dystopic, foreclosed future, a bleak future, and try to think of a different kind of engagement using architecture and urban planning as tools for that engagement. Mm -hmm. And this is the project I'm part of. Yeah, definitely with all these groups. Do you want to say something about what your next research is? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, my, my next project is working on, in general, post-conflict uh, post, post urban research, but partnering with AUB, partnering, partnering with public works, partnering with other civil groups, to try to think about how to expand this notion of how to think of planning. First, how to re do research in conflict cities. So this is actually a big question. Like, How do you do the ethnographic field on the ground work in cities of conflict? We don't really have very good answers for that. In my book, I try to engage in one way, and I'm sure other people are trying to do it different ways. So to extend this kind of work with people who are doing work on the group, to start an urban lab at AUB that bring people from all sorts of, of um, in collaboration with Colombia, to, to, to bring all sorts of people who work on the urban question, not only planners and designers, but also activists, residents, etc., to think about a different kind of horizon than the war yet to come. Mm -hmm. And to engage the region, too. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, looking at your list of uh, protagonists, mainly the sectarian group, I wonder whether refugee or refugee-related groups are also a protagonist, either established ones, like UNRWA, the UN Refugee Organization for Palestinians and their influence on the urban planning scene, if any, or um, more recent displacement by the Syrian population, either as protagonists themselves, you know, groups of, of that uh, population, or as uh, an excuse used by um, others as part of, you know, future imagined war or, or any or that or any similar. Thing. I mean, there. Uh, the current project that's part of the project I was talking uh, about uh, in response to Clear Stuff 
is also related. One layer of that I'm exploring is the layer of the refugees that are currently living, especially in the peripheries that I, dis I discussed. And there are many things I can say in response to this question, but I want to highlight two things. First, that there is this shift in the discussion from uh, Sunni Shia to Syrian Lebanese that is happening, in which many of the people do, like think right now of the Syrian refugee as this as the new threat on the local level. So this is one way. And at the same time, there are many uh, institutions that are involved in supporting the, the everyday life of the Syrian refugees. So this is both happening. First, this, uh, um, a change in the kind of debate vis-a-vis -vis who's the other with the arrival of the Syrian refugees, but that at the same time, at the same time engagement of mosques and UNRWA and UNHCR and all sorts of agents in trying to make the life of uh, the refugees, in, uh, especially in poor peripheries, uh, manageable. The other, the other thing is actually how in the most recent, more recent fights, there's always episodes of violence, sectarian violence going on. For example, in Dahit Aramun, not very long time ago, like uh, six, seven months ago, there was another violence, and uh, another episode of violence. And it was a little bit uh, divided, with, like the refugees had to choose one side in order to continue securing some kind of uh, like uh, water and uh, um, access to certain kind of uh, food and stuff. So they had ended up being plugged into that violence between what was happening uh, between the uh, groups affiliated to Hezbollah and groups affiliated to Sunni, uh, Sunni Future Movement. And there are also other stories that, but these are two examples. Um, so, uh, so I, this might be also, uh, this might be a silly question, but I see that sect and sectarian mapping is a big part of your book, but I was also wondering about class and gentrification. I'm from Lebanon, I was just a group for three months, and what struck me the most is how, uh, uh, as this, and probably around the whole Middle East and under the liberal age, it's like these construction of spaces really defined by class and these kinds of private projects um, that are kind of pushing uh, even Lebanese people out on the peripheries. So I was interested in that, um, on the idea of class and gentrification, uh, cross sect. And then um, also, not only refugees, but also um, migrant communities in Lebanon which we're seeing more and more of African communities, Sri Lankan communities, Filipino, people who are, are coming to engage in either domestic or other forms of labor, who are uh, not Palestinian or Syrian or Arab. Uh, so those two things. Maybe let's take uh, one last question, and then please stick, for, stick around for wine. Yes. yes. More questions around wine. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you so much, and I really look forward to reading this book. I just want to ask one question about, the, you are writing about the frontier, like you are calling it the frontier. What's the relationship between this frontier and what Souvenir did? The, it, like when I was doing my fieldwork a, a long time ago, much earlier, everybody was talking about the compensations were given to these displaced people, and they would go to the doctor. And that's what you are doing, that when they go to the doctor, that's what, what, what this is what's happening, like it's a jungle of cement. And when they were receiving their compensations, people who were basically rebuilding the downtown Beirut, the Hariri, and all of his groups, they wanted just to get rid of those uh, unwanted people who sent them to the frontier. And they didn't care. And then when I interviewed them, they were saying, oh, they would go back to their religion. No one needs to go to the and they will go to the doctor. And so what's the connection between the frontier and the center there? And another um, comment, it's about, maybe for the commentators who are talking about the global south, and is it possible to do that? I'm really not sure if, if, if that's even possible. When I was uh, interviewing urban planner, one urban planner in Beirut, I walked into his office and there was a huge map of Boston and he is rebuilding downtown Beirut. And uh, because of the, with this global elite, the cosmopolitan elite in all Arab cities, they are being educated uh, in the West, here. <laughs> here, as I might say, in those places. And they go back, even if you work in the Dahi and do like planning in Beirut, you are bringing the global north to the heart of the global south, although you are from the global. Like, it's really a predicament. Like, it's really nice to have nostalgia for the global south and the ability to do things, 
that the global north is making the global south now, which is, uh, I hope they will answer this. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to try to answer uh, part of uh, Asil's question and your question. So definitely, I'm, I'm doing the, my research, or I'm trying to understand Beirut from its peripheries, and it's definitely related to the gentrification that happened from the Solidaire, the post-war reconstruction project, where many were displaced, and your work is uh, like the best account we have about that, uh, about like the people who were uh, squatting in, in, the post in downtown Beirut, and then they, had, they were displaced or they had to be evicted during the post-war reconstruction project. Many of them eventually moved to al dahi And then at the same time, even Hariri, Hariri the, prime minister, the late prime minister at the time, he also had a big vision of Beirut to, like, um, uh, to be like Dubai or to be more than Dubai. So he was also, so many of the Sunni families were being gentrified. They couldn't afford anymore even the areas around downtown or even Tariq al -Jdidi. So Dawhaq al for those of you from Lebanon would know that it's called the new Tariq Jdidi, right. which is the new Sunni low-income area. And so here, basically what the research I'm doing is about mostly low, middle, and low-income people fighting over space. The rich, are, the, rich are not, the rich people are not part of this. This is where the frontiers are, the frontiers of people who are ter territorial domination by these religious groups over mostly people who cannot afford to live in the city where the apartment is in the half million and more. Uh, when I first started doing research in Sahra Shwaifid, the apartment was eighteen thousand uh, dollars, and most of the act, most of the developers that started developing Hezbo uh, uh, at the time were subsidized in some way or another by Hezbollah and Harakat Amma, and so it didn't create, it didn't, they didn't give housing to the people. So that's not charity that I'm talking about here, but I'm talking about in a way, in a way in which these actors were subsidized and they were able to provide low cost housing. And then you can see, oh, keep seeing the new phases of displacement with every episode of violence. These people are, have to pack and leave, and they are actually mostly the middle and low income people. So this is, these are the populations that are being affected. And it's very much related to the gen layers and layers of gentrification that have, been that have been happening in Beirut for a long time, starting with Solidarity itself. Yeah. And then I said, yes, I mean, most, most of the planners I, will, I was interviewing, they would start like, what are you doing here? Why are you studying this? And then they will open like plans of another area like Miziara, which is this beautiful, beautiful town with like red tile roofs. Look at Miziara, you can do concentric circles models here. Forget about dirty planning in Sahra Shwefit. Why are you, why is a woman studying that? You know, like, <laughs> so definitely they were pulling on me the whole like Boston, Montreal, uh, Paris story. <laughs> but to go back to Tim's point, they're still trying to do something with what they have and try to Imagine, like, so the, one of the planners for Sakhir Shwefet kept telling me how he was trying over and over time to separate the industries from the residentials by green belts, but that the religious political organizations were not listening to him, and then in the end he had to abort his, uh, his vision for the area. So despite everything, they were trying to still uh, bring their own professional ideals to, to these spaces. And then that's how you end up with the lace work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.